Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Anurag Myral. We're super excited that you're an integral part of developing this entire COVID DB program and that you're here with us to be our very first COVID speaker uh, in our series. So this is our inaugural video. We wanted to cover some basics around COVID-19. And if you don't mind, we'll just jump right into the questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sarkar. This, uh... This initiative, covidtv.org, is such a remarkable effort uh, to shed light and eliminate uh, on the complexity of this disease and the impact that it has on our, our society. It's just a joy and a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. We're Again, we're just super excited to have you. Um, so we've seen a number of illnesses through history, like SARS and HIV. What do you think is different about this virus and the way that it behaves? Well, this is... I mean, as, as the name suggests, it's a novel coronavirus. I mean, this is part of a family of coronaviruses uh, that have been around in, in the society for a while, but this is a new entrant to that, that, that club. Um, and as such, we, there's a lot that we don't know about this, this virus and the disease that it causes, COVID-19. Um, you know, the kind of symptoms that it, uh, it, you know, patients exhibit, uh, the impact it has on the different parts of the organs, and, and the list is is uh, growing um, and it's quite confusing actually, to be honest with you, the, the kinds of uh, symptoms uh, that disease manifests itself uh, in um, and different organs such as you know, brain and heart and lungs and toes even, you know, that, that actually get impacted by that. So that's number one. Number two, it's, uh, it's more infectious than the traditional flu. It's similar, similar infection rate, R not as it's called. Um, uh, as HIV and, and the SARS-1, the first SARS, um, it's less infectious than, uh, you know, uh, things like measles, um, but it's definitely more infectious than the traditional flu. Um, the, the third thing about this is that it's um, the, the fatality rate, the mortality that results from this disease uh, is far more than, uh, than the flu, uh, the CFR, the case fatality rate or the uh, you know, IFR, infection fatality rate, number of people who die uh, divided by number of people who are infected, uh, that's very high. Although the, this IFR right now is under some controversy because of the, um, uh, you know, uh, some of the tests, recent uh, tests about, uh, uh, that, that, that have said that the uh, rate, rate of population that's been infected is greater than, than uh, believed. Uh, but I think generally it's believed that it's, you know, it, it kills more people the, the, the uh, fatality rate is, is greater than traditional flu. And, and then, um, you know, the, the, the other two factors that are really um, significant about this, this disease and this particular virus is that the incubation period ranges from a few days to a few weeks. So you don't know how long somebody is, uh, the, the infection is incubating in somebody and that person remains infectious during that time. Uh, and the last thing, which is probably the scariest of uh, them all is that you can be infectious even when you're asymptomatic. Um, and uh, up to 80% of the patients uh, uh, that have been infected by this virus um, uh, uh, have, are believed to be uh, asymptomatic, although asymptomatic is, is in quotes because um, you know, asymptomatic means that patients who are not showing up at the hospitals with, uh, and reporting symptoms or are calling in with symptoms. Um, so that doesn't mean that the, all the 80% of them have no symptoms at all. It's just those symptoms are not significant enough that um, uh, people find them, uh, um, you know, worthy of being uh, worthy of reporting. So those are the the, the characteristics that make this disease uh, pretty unique and and uh, confusing and and uh, uh, difficult to deal with. There is a positive element of this disease, if, if there was one, and that is. Um, it's um, the mutation rate of mutation um, is, is lower. Um, so far, we believe that there is only one strain, one common strain that, uh, that this, this virus uh, uh, has manifested itself as, uh, although there have been many mutations, um, but those mutation, mutations are uh, fewer than, let's say, traditional flu, flu mutation. So which means that it might lend itself, um, might, uh, to to a vaccine um, that may be effective down the road. Yeah, let's hope that that, that stays the case in terms of mutations. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, that makes me think about testing and testing has been a challenge from the beginning of this crisis and we've made some progress and we've got scientists working around the clock trying to do what they can. Um, could you talk us through a little bit about the history of testing and where we are now and what some predictions could be for the future as well? Indeed, um, you know, uh, there's this mantra that most public health officials and um, in, and uh, in the healthcare system, generally, folks have been have been repeating is that to deal with this disease, we need extensive testing, extensive contact tracing, and then isolation of those that uh, that are infected. Uh, it's been very hard to do. Uh, first of all, there's 7.5 billion people in the world, and and you potentially economically, financially, you couldn't test them all. Uh, but we could we probably could test more than that the number of people that we are testing right now. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's quite a bit of room there. The problem has been uh, testing is not the same everywhere. I mean, the history of testing of, uh, for this disease is fraught with uh, many failures. Um, you know, uh, early tests were, first of all, the, a new test needed to be developed for this, and it took a while. Um, different countries developed the tests uh, at their own, in their own way. Uh, in fact, healthcare institutions, they developed their own tests in their own way. Um, and there was not a global coordination and sharing of insights and data on that, um, not as much as, as uh, one would have liked. Uh, so that's been a, a big challenge. Um, add to that, um, the difficulty in gathering the samples, you know, uh, nasal swab has been the most dominant way, uh, most prom you know, prim the primary way uh, that samples have been collected uh, for, for diagnosis of the disease. Um, but, you know, how deep do you, take the swap from, you know, who does it. Uh, and this is not the only disease where uh, sampling uh, is a challenge. I mean, malaria is another one, right? A um, uh, number of other diseases. So, but in, in this case, because it's such a widespread disease and so, um, you know, so quickly moving, um, you know, the, the sampling and, and tell, you know, how you gather the sample has been, has been a challenge. Uh, combine that with the uh, challenge with, uh, with the early tests, uh, the data um, has not really been that credible early on. Um, uh, the, the third thing has been that it's um, a lot of these tests, uh, at least the good tests, tests that are uh, that have been um, um, more accurate, um, the PCR tests, RT-PCR tests. Those have uh, those can only be done in a in a reference lab, in a in a laboratory setting. Those cannot be done at the point of care, which means that you got to collect the sample, you got to send the sample to the lab. And you have to actually then do the test and then then report the results back. But there's a time lag. I mean, sometimes days, uh, if not weeks. Uh, and that means that if a patient comes in and gets a test done and then goes home, and you don't have a way to to tr uh, trace that patient, that patient or track that patient, you could lose that patient. Um, and during that time that you you're doing the testing or the test results are waited, that patient could be interacting with others um, if the isolation is not followed. So that's been a challenge too. Um, there have been a number of um, uh, tests that, a uh, number of different ways of doing the tests that, um, that have uh, been put forward other than swab, there have been some saliva tests and so on. Um, and those have not really been proven to be as effective as the RT-PCR test. So, so that's, that's made things more difficult. I think going forward, um, the diagnostic tests, tests for, you know, uh, whether a patient is currently infected by, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2 virus, the, this virus that causes uh, COVID-19 disease. Uh, I think we have a good handle on it now, um, as long as we are, we are using the, the gold standard RT-PCR tests. Uh, and I think the, uh, the timelines have, have shrunk and they have, now we can do the tests in a much shorter period. There are some rapid tests that have been developed by the industry um, but they, those those are still um, not uh, you know ready for prime time, I would say. But uh, but I think RT PCR tests are, are good to go, and I think that you can rely on on that data. Um, there is a, another kind of test that uh, that has been in the news recently. Uh, these are serological tests, mm -hmm. and these are more for the uh, detection of uh, antibodies on, on, amongst patients that may have been exposed uh, to the virus. Um, and that's where a lot of controversy is today. Um, these tests actually take a drop of blood and very quickly uh, tell, uh, uh, tell us whether uh, the patient has presence of antibodies or not. Um, it, it's believed that if you have antibodies uh, after exposure to this, this virus, 
um, that you might be immune to the disease or you may not be infectious or both, uh, although that's not proven yet. We cannot assume that. And add to that this issue of these serological tests, these antibody tests, having a certain false positive rate. Um, because vast majority of the population has not been infected or has not been exposed to the infection, even small percentage of the patients uh, of, um, uh, of uh, positives or false positives can actually skew your assessment of what part of the population has been exposed to uh, this virus uh, can be problematic. And you definitely cannot use that to say, you as an individual in Iraq or Priya as an individual uh, was infected before and is now free of that infection and now has antibodies. You just can't make that judgment. And as a result, you can't make, use that to go back to work or, or uh, interact with the rest of the world population. So that's where most of our challenges are right now. Mm -hmm. And just getting current information has been so important and getting it through various channels, you know, at uh, Teach Aids, we're incredibly careful about combating myths and providing accurate information uh, anywhere, anytime that we can. Uh, just being so close to the problem, what do you think some are of the biggest misconceptions have been so far? And can you help clarify <laughs> some of those? Well, <laughs> where do I start? Uh, the, the, we, could, we could talk days about this one. Um, because this disease and this virus is such a, such a slippery customer, if I can use that phrase. Um, you know, it's, it's been hard. I mean, so it's not intentional that a lot of these misconceptions and uh, myths and uh, confusion uh, exists. Uh, for example, uh, early on in, in the evolution of this, this, this uh, pandemic, uh, the recommendation was that nobody should use masks, only the healthcare workers should use masks. Right. Um, or the, only the patients who have been actually diagnosed with this disease should use masks. A lot of that was driven by um, the realization that there were, very, there were very few people that were infected and um, you know, most of those could be identified and, and, and isolated and then there was a there was a shortage of PPE, um, and that's why the guideline was what it was. Um, but since then, uh, we have learned that people can be asymptomatic and could infect you. We, uh, you know, uh, the incubation period is, ranges uh, such a wide range in a, such a wide range of time period um, that there are more people that were that are infected than we originally thought. Um, and as a result, the, the the guideline now is that everyone should use masks. Um, you know, but even if it's a homemade mask that prevents from my, you know, the micro particles from being, uh, you know, uh, ejected or, or inhaled or, um, or ingested, right? Uh, so I, I think that's, that's one um, uh, confusing uh, part of, uh, um, of this, this, you know, public health where I, the, the, you know, we are now recommending, everybody's recommending that we use masks. Everybody should use masks as you go out. Um, you know, it does protect you. It protects others if you have the disease and you don't know it. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of this is, has to do with the size of the particle that may be airborne. That's the other, other confusion, whether uh, this virus can be airborne or not. Uh, early on, we believed that this was not airborne, that this was uh, mostly large particulates that could only hang around in the air for a couple of minutes. And then, and, and the, the distance to which these droplets could travel was a, a few feet, maximum three feet. That's why you had three feet of social distancing as the guideline. And then they extended that to six feet. Uh, and, and now it's believed that you could be in the vicinity and you could still uh, be in the zone uh, that these particulates could be. So- um, Could you um, define for our audience what airborne means? Yeah, so th that's a great question. Airborne typically means that uh, a particle that contains this virus can be in the air for long enough duration. So for example, if you aerosolize something, you spray something in the air, the particles can remain in the air for like a, like a air freshener or whatever, can remain in the air for uh, tens of minutes, if not more, right? So typically airborne means something that can hang around for longer than a few minutes. Um, and uh, typically the particles, uh, if you go to quote, 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 unquote, micro hydrodynamics of particles, uh, you know, these particles are typically in the size of range of 0.1 micron to, say, you know, uh, less than 10 microns. Those are microparticles typically. Um, the mo moment you get larger than 10 microns, these become macroparticles or larger microparticles, and they do fall off uh, under the force of gravity. But these microparticles aren't subject to gravity as much, and they're, you know, wind, the way the wind, wind is blowing, how small these particles are, 
uh, what thermal currents might be and so on, that these microparticles could sort of float around for a while. So if you're just walking through an area, somebody who may have coughed in uh, you know, five minutes back or 10 minutes back, you could actually come into contact with that. Likelihood of that is low, uh, but it is non-zero. That is why we are recommending that everybody uh, should use masks. So you can, you can start to see how all of these sort of different uh, behaviors of this, uh, this virus actually influence the choices you make around uh, public health policy with masks and, and, and things like that. Absolutely, and it makes a lot of sense now why everyone should be wearing a mask of some, some sort to protect themselves as well as everyone else around them. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, we know you've been on the front lines of this crisis. So first of all, thank you so much for everything that you're trying to do to help with all of this. If you had a crystal ball, <laughs> what would be a few of your predictions for our future in our world? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And a lot of folks are contending with that. First of all, um, you know, it's really been the nurses and the healthcare workers and the doctors who have been at the, at the front line of this. They really have won the, they really have been the, the soldiers at the front line. Uh, and I, I think that analogy is, is, is correct in my opinion. Uh, and they have also won the brunt of, of this disease. A pretty high percentage of the healthcare, uh, of, of the people who have perished on, uh, uh, because of this disease have been health workers. And I have the greatest of the respect for them. And a lot of my colleagues uh, at Stanford Biodesign and at Stanford Global Health have been part of that. And I have a lot of greatest of respect for them. Um, uh, you know, the, the effect of this disease is so extensive. This is, you know, once in a hundred year kind of phenomenon. Um, and it has impacted more countries and territories than there are members of the UN. 210 plus countries and, and territories have been impacted by this. It affects the rich and the poor and uh, old and, and, and the young, even though it was believed originally that young don't get as impacted by it. Uh, I think there's growing evidence that uh, young kids can also be impacted by this. Um, it has impacted the most vulnerable the most, uh, whether you have had um, comorbidities, uh, heart disease, lung disease, um, uh, you know, uh, diabetes, uh, you are at a high risk, uh, cancer, something that has affected your immune system. Um, but it has also impacted the, uh, the broader part of the population, our students, our, our high school students and the primary school students and the college students. It has impacted our professionals who go to work. So um, I think the impact of this disease on how we, what kind of future we have on the other end of this crisis, if there is an other, other end of the crisis, um, and I believe there is, uh, I think this is gonna look very different. Uh, the way our, our social models are gonna change, um, the way we interact with each other has already changed, but I think uh, that's going to sustain a lot of that is going to sustain in the future. Our, uh, how we work is going is, is to change. Our future work, um, you know, Twitter has already announced that uh, its work, workforce can work from home forever. Um, I believe there's going to be a hybrid uh, model where folks will come to work um, where they have to, um, but a lot of folks will choose to actually blend uh, you know, work from home and work from office uh, and going forward. And a remarkable thing is not just going to be in the tech industry, it's probably going to be uh, uh, outside of the tech industry and it's going to be global. Um, uh, there is going to be new um, uh, models for healthcare. I think um, a, a key challenge has been um, being able to see patients uh, in, 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 in light of this crisis. Patients have been worried about coming into the hospital. Uh, there's an inverted U-shaped curve in the, in the healthcare system where in the 30s and 40s, most of the care was provided at home and, and uh, uh, in the near home. Um, there, there's, a, there's a strong uh, belief among the healthcare professionals that um, I think we're gonna go back to that and new technology is gonna play a role in that. Um, a, a big impact is gonna be on uh, local uh, policy making. I think a lot of what you've seen in COVID-19 uh, in this crisis is that a lot of decision-making has been local. Bay Area, six counties in the Bay Area were the first in the nation to declare uh, uh, stringent uh, shelter at home guidelines and that protected this, this, this area from, a, uh, from outcomes like the ones that we saw in New York. Uh, so there's gonna be a lot of desire to uh, 
manage manage future uh, crises locally uh, with local decision making and local resources. Uh, another uh, impact that we're going to see is in terms of our supply chain, our manufacturing. It's going to be much more uh, distributed and much more localized. I think some of that is going to be good for the society because uh, you know we're going to have a lot more local focus, uh, and maybe artisans are going to get uh, a more support and more um, encouragement as a result of this. But it will mean that maybe costs will go up, and uh, there may be redundancy in our in our uh, in our society uh, in terms of the capacity. Um, so we, we don't know what the future is exactly going to be, but we, we are starting to see some of these trends emerge. And uh, I think the future is going to look very different. The new normal is going to be actually new. Uh, that's, that's what a lot of us believe. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been talking a lot about science and facts, and we know that sheltering in place has been quite difficult for all of us. Um, the impact on us physically and, you know, emotionally, psychologically has been really challenging. Are there any insights that you could share as concluding thoughts? Yeah, I think um, we know that this is a significant crisis to hit in our lifetime and, and, and many lifetimes, actually. Um, I don't think anybody is alive today who has gone through an experience like this. Mm -hmm. And I think many, the impact of this is going to be on the future generations. Um, and we're going to be in a, in a new uh, world, as, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, not all of that is going to be bad. Um, I think I would, what I would love to focus on is the uh, optimistic perspective um, that, that emerges from this crisis. Um, um, and I, there are three things that I would like to really point out. Number one, I think we have really reprioritized. I think last few months, all of us, including myself and my family, we have actually realized that uh, certain things are more important than the other things. We have learned to do with less. We have learned to focus on interpersonal relationships. We have learned that life is can be, life can be un uncertain, and uh, the moment that we are in is probably the most important moment, and we need to make that moment count. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of that is is really positive for our society. I think we would we, we probably will see. Um, shifting of our goals as, as a society. Uh, maybe we'll care a lot more for our environment. Um, uh, we'll care a lot more for uh, human relationships. Uh, I think that all of that is positive. The second thing that I, I, I'm, you know, being in Silicon Valley and being an innovator, uh, I'm very enthused by the role of innovation um, in all of this. I mean, uh, you know, we, Stanford Biodesign works extensively with innovators in India, and innovators have had a front and center role in the, the way that country has dealt with this crisis. Uh, young innovators have been leading the charge in coming up with new solutions mm -hmm. for their, their, their communities. Mm -hmm. And um, that innovation is gonna bend uh, uh, the cost outcome curve as it's called. We're gonna be able to do a far more with hopefully far less mm -hmm. in the future. Uh, it's gonna hopefully bring about uh, new ways of doing things through technology, through other innovations, through care pathway innovations, through social innovations, through behavioral innovations uh, that would allow us to uh, do things better um, in, in a more effective way. So that's a, that's a second uh, you know, silver lining that I see here. And then the last one, and this is not a done, done deal. This is, this is a hope, uh, as much hope as it's the uh, evidence of, of this happening is equity. I, I, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the part of the community, part of the society that's in, that has been impacted the most by this disease have been the vulnerable, the poor, yeah. the, uh, the disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, the governments and the civic society has taken note of that and they have actually stepped up in some ways to address that. Um, you know, the shelter in place happened for everybody in the, in the Bay Area, right? So we all contributed to that. Uh, we all uh, weighed in. Um, you know, uh, there have been neighbors, my neighbors actually, who have made these uh, masks that we actually benefited from ourselves. I, I, I chose not to take masks from our healthcare institutions that I'm involved in uh, because, you know, early on, we need healthcare providers, uh, our, our uh, healthcare professionals who have access to that. But our community, our, our neighbors actually made these masks and they distributed that in the community. Mm -hmm. Seva International, which is a nonprofit organization 
that works uh, on on uh, on can, uh, pandemics and crises like these. They've been actually delivering food and and uh, uh, you know uh, groceries to old and, and the sick. Um, so a lot of folks, you know, there've been hotels, private hotels that have opened up their rooms for the homeless. Mm -hmm. So it's just been a society has come together. Uh, to, to really look out for the uh, disenfranchised. Um, my hope is that we take that to the next level where governments, you know, countries actually look out for each other, that uh, they work with each other. Uh, rich countries actually help out the poorer countries. Um, you know, technologically more advanced countries actually help out countries that have uh, a lot of work still to be done on the technological front. Um, I, I, I think we are seeing some really good evidence that people, at, at least at the people level, people to people level, um, uh, you know, there has been this desire to uh, to help each other. And uh, I, my hope is that uh, we become a global community as a result of this and we address future crises, not just health crises or any crisis that, that hits, uh, that, that this world confronts that we, are, we do this together, not, not as individuals or not as, as uh, countries with artificial borders. You know, they say with the, the greatest challenges in the world come the greatest opportunities as well. And I agree, it's been incredible to watch people come together, you know, while social distancing, figuring out ways to come together to help support one another in ways that, you know, you wouldn't see unless you had a crisis like this. So that's been really inspiring and hopeful. Uh, well, Great. thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for sharing this knowledge with us. We're so grateful and uh, really excited to share this with our global community. Well, thank you, Pia, for having me. And thank you for what you're doing with uh, Teach Aids and with COVID-DB. Um, it's, it's a joy to be associated with it. It's an, it's an incredible team that we have, a huge team effort. Thank, thank you. you.